It is good to be with you again tonight to study from the book of Acts. I hope you're all doing well. I hope to see you for worship this coming Sunday, either at 9 or 11. And I hope all of you can be present for the class again at 10. We're shifting into a new study this week. And for our members, please remember to use the Sign Up Genius account if you're able to do that, to sign up for one of the two worship services. Uh, that's based on your entry in the church directory. Use that email, the same email you use for church. But uh, guests are always welcome at uh, either of those services. And then also for the class in between at 10. Uh, tonight we are continuing with our study of the book of Acts, which is a history of the early church written by Luke, the beloved physician. He is, of course, writing to a man by the name of Theophilus, most excellent Theophilus, so perhaps some kind of government official, and he's giving this man a summary of the beginning of the church, as well as the activities primarily of Peter and then of Paul. Uh, up to this point in the book, we've looked at the first 12 chapters. We are uh, looking at chapter 13 again this week, we are partway through this chapter in the ABCs of Acts, which is our memory tool. We have the ascension in chapter 1. We have the beginning of the church in chapter 2. The man who couldn't walk was carried and cured in chapter 3. We had the determined disciples who wouldn't stop preaching in chapter 4. In Acts 5, we had the empty jail. We had the first deacons, but always with the question mark in Acts 6. In Acts 7, we had Stephen, the great hero. In Acts 8, we had the eunuch's response to Philip's question, do you understand what you are reading? And the eunuch replies, how could I or how can I unless someone guides me? In Acts 9, in the vision on the road to Damascus, the Lord identifies himself to Saul by saying, I am Jesus. So that is letter I there in chapter 9. In Acts 10, we had the journey to Joppa as Cornelius sends messengers looking for Peter. In Acts 11, we had the reminder that the kingdom now includes Gentiles, as Peter explains the baptism of Cornelius to the Jews back in Jerusalem. In Acts 12, we had Peter liberated again, and then last week we moved into chapter 13, where we had missionaries sent out. They were sent out not from Jerusalem, but from Antioch, where the disciples were first called Christians. So the base of operations for outreach has kind of shifted a little bit north here, getting out of Jerusalem, where the persecution was getting intense. And getting up there to Antioch, where a lot of Gentiles were baptized and a lot of new people were being added. So you may remember in the opening verses of Acts 13, they serve the Lord, they fast, and they pray. And then the church sends out Barnabas and Saul along with John Mark as a helper. And then they immediately go to Cyprus. And on Cyprus, they meet Sergius Paulus, who is a government official who wants to hear the gospel. But they're opposed by Elymas, the magician. And Saul strikes Elymas blind. And it's also at this moment that Saul starts to be known as Paul, perhaps because of this new believer, uh, Sergius Paulus. I didn't refer to it last week, but we do have some rather famous artwork on this passage. And uh, since it is by Raphael, uh, the copyright is not an issue. We can actually share some artwork in class tonight. And so this is Raphael's painting entitled St. Paul Before the Proconsul. Uh, dating to the early 1500s. We have Paul on the left. Uh, Paul is the guy with the halo. I don't know if you can make that out. And in my screen, I can just barely see a little ring around uh, Paul's head there. You can always identify Paul with a halo. I guess they tended to do that in the 1500s. Uh, we have Sergius Paulus, I'm assuming, the proconsul up there on the throne, ruling, doing his thing, listening to Paul. And then we seem to have Elymas looking a bit concerned with his eyes closed. That, that's how you can tell he's blind, because his eyes are closed, I suppose, but he's there on the right. Uh, but nevertheless, it is at this moment that Saul starts to be known as Paul, because, perhaps because of the influence of this new believer, uh, Sergius Paulus. At least that's one of, the, uh, one of the theories out there, that Paul was so impressed by this man, or maybe it's because Paul is reaching out to Gentiles now, and he either gets a new name or he shifts to more of a a Greek name that he already had. So now from here on, he's known as Paul instead of Saul. So tonight then we pick up with the rest of Acts chapter 13. And the first paragraph here is Acts 13 verses 13 through 15. Acts 13, 13 through 15. Now Paul and his companions put out to sea from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. But John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But going on from Perga, they arrived at Pisidian Antioch, and on the Sabbath day they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading of the Law and the Prophets, the synagogue officials sent to them, saying, Brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say it. Before we go any further in this chapter, I want to put the map on the screen again, the one we looked at uh, last week and the week before, just to try to help us visualize what's going on here, what's happening here, and where these things are happening. In verse 13, Luke tells us that Paul and his companions put out to sea from Paphos. 
If you remember, that's on the west coast of Cyprus, Cyprus being that little island in the Mediterranean that looks a little bit like the United States. Um, and they sail from there up to Perga, that's in the region of Pamphylia. And from there, they head up to Antioch of Pisidia, or Pisidian Antioch, as it's translated here. And this is where we find that there are at least two Antiochs in the ancient world. So they leave from Antioch of Syria, and now they are arriving in Antioch of Pisidia. This has always been frustrating to me. Why can't we have cities with different names? But uh, anyway, we have two Antiochs, at least, in the ancient world. And we got to keep these straight by looking at a map or by looking it up in some way to see which one we're referring to. So they're, they're heading up here to Antioch of Pisidia. Somewhere between Paphos and Perga, though, we find in this passage that John Mark bails on the crew, and he goes back home to Jerusalem. And it may seem like a rather random thing to mention here, it may seem rather insignificant, but we need to remember this because it apparently causes some very uh, hard feelings between Paul and Barnabas. It'll come up a little bit later, uh, toward the end of chapter 15, I believe, when Barnabas wants John Mark to go with them on a second trip, and Paul objects to it. He says, no, we're not taking that guy. He abandoned us. And so Paul is referring back to what happens here as John Mark deserting them. And basically, Paul argues they can't afford to give this young man a second chance on such an important mission. Uh, Barnabas, though, as an encourager, he is the guy of second chances. And he wants to do what's best for John Mark. And Paul wants what's best for the mission itself. And Barnabas and Paul have what is described as a sharp disagreement. And it is so sharp that they actually part ways. And again, we'll get to this in a few weeks, but uh, I just want to emphasize there, it is not a, a matter of doctrine. It's not one of them saying baptism is necessary and the other one saying it's faith only, nothing like that. It's not a worship issue. It's not a, a matter of faith. Uh, this is a matter of methods. This is a matter of how to accomplish what God has told us to do when he hasn't given us the little details. And so going on a mission trip today, do we walk down the street? Do we take a plane to a foreign country? Uh, those are areas where God has not legislated. We have some freedom there. And so maybe we would compare it to that. But we'll look at that again in a few weeks when we get to that. But this is where that actual disagreement kind of starts. There, there are some hard feelings based here. But anyway, back in our passage, I want to start by pointing out that instead of Barnabas and Saul... As in the previous, ref previous references, we now read about Paul and his companions, so a, a possible indication of Paul's leadership of this group. So first of all, it's not just Barnabas and Saul anymore, but it is Paul and his companions, or Paul and his people, uh, indicating that some others have joined in on this mission. But also, we note that Paul's name comes first now. Uh, Barnabas was the encourager, but now, having been encouraged... Uh, Paul is now out in front on this mission, and Barnabas seems to, at this point, take on something of a more uh, supportive role instead of a leadership role uh, between the two. Uh, and now Paul and his companions, they arrive in Pisidian Antioch, about 100 miles inland, uh, requiring some very dangerous travel in an area known as being rather dangerous due to the risk of getting robbed along the way. This is kind of a less inhabited area. Then some of those areas we might find over between Jerusalem and the other Antioch. So this is more out in the middle of nowhere. But once they get up to Antioch, he and his people head to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And they sit down. The synagogue assembly starts with the reading of the Law and the Prophets. And after the reading, the officials basically invite Paul to speak. Brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say it. So speak up. Here's your chance. If you want to say anything to this group, say it. Uh, the word exhortation is a word I just briefly referred to on Sunday, at least at one of our services I pointed this out, but it comes from a word meaning to call to one side. And so it's the idea of encouragement. When we stand beside somebody and put our arm around their shoulders and maybe say or do something encouraging. So that's what they are inviting Paul to do here. If you have a word of encouragement, if you have a word of exhortation, if you want to stand beside us with your arm around our shoulder, figuratively speaking, uh, now is your chance. We want to invite you to speak at this time. Uh, I'm assuming at this point that they are not completely aware of who Paul is. Maybe they didn't know all of the details that had gone on over the past several years. Um, he seems to be a knowledgeable man. He obviously has some kind of a Jewish background. Um, and so he's invited to be a guest speaker at this congregation. 
I remember passing through Beloit several years ago, and we showed up uh, just a few minutes before Bible class began, and the preacher came up to me and he said, hey, you know, I'm not feeling 100% today. I'm not feeling too well. Uh, would you be willing to preach today? And here it was like the last day of our vacation. As I remember, we were coming in from somewhere, and uh, and I ended up preaching that morning. And, um, and that's what they're inviting Paul to do. He shows up, and the law and the prophets are read, and then they say, if you have something you want to say, go ahead and say it. Uh, most of the rest of this chapter, then, is basically a record of Paul's sermon at the synagogue in Antioch of Pisidia. So we pick up then tonight with Acts 13, 16 through 25, as Paul gets up to speak. Acts 13, 16 through 25. Paul stood up and, motioning with his hand, said, Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers, and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt, and with an uplifted arm he led them out from it. For a period of about forty years he put up with them in the wilderness. When he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land as an inheritance, all of which took about four hundred and fifty years. After these things he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for forty years. After he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, concerning whom he has also testified and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. From the descendants of this man, according to promise, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus. After John had proclaimed before his coming a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, and while John was completing his course, he kept saying, What do you suppose that I am? I am not he. But behold, one is coming after me, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. So Paul stands up to speak. He motions with his hand. He addresses these people as you who fear God. He starts with a compliment. He seems very uh, tolerant here. Obviously, they're not on the same page in terms of what God has taught them. The, he's talking to people who are not Christians at this point. Uh, tolerant might not be the best. Best might not be the best way to put this. Maybe um, kind or uh, diplomatic. Maybe a better way of describing what's going on here. But one reason for this might be um, Paul has been where these people are right now, hasn't he been? Paul has been here. He's been on the receiving end of this kind of sermon. Uh, but also notice, just because he addresses these people as those who fear God, uh, that doesn't mean that they're okay where they are. To be God-fearing is a great start. That's awesome. But there's something else that they need to know, and there are a number of things that they need to do. And so let's not assume, based on his kind and diplomatic introduction, that Paul thinks these people are pleasing to God just as they are. That is not the case. But notice he starts with a history lesson, a, a big-picture review of Jewish history. This, by the way, is very similar to Peter's sermon in Acts 2, where he gives a history of the Jewish people. It's also very similar to Stephen's sermon in Acts chapter 7. Uh, some have suggested that Paul heard Stephen's sermon. Uh, he was definitely there to hold the coats of those who stoned Stephen, but it's also possible that Paul heard what Stephen said that day. And so it's possible that Paul patterns his own words here after what Stephen said. Obviously, uh, inspiration is a factor. Paul is inspired. He is an apostle and so on. Um, but we also see people's uh, personalities reflected in the sermons that they preach in Scripture. And so it's possible that Stephen's sermon, in that sense, uh, had some influence over what Paul has to say here. But in this sermon, Paul basically gives just a, a very brief review of Jewish history, bringing them from Egypt to David in six verses. <laughs> This is the Cliff Notes version of the Old Testament. It's all here in six verses. And so he's kind of, uh, don't, don't want to say dumbing it down, but he's making it very, very simple, just getting the basics here, especially for those who are really not Jewish people here quite yet. Uh, there are some God-fearers who have maybe made some progress toward converting, but weren't quite there uh, at this point. So he makes it very, very simple. Uh, God chose our fathers. He made them great in Egypt. He then brought them out of Egypt where they wandered in the wilderness. Um, I find it interesting how Paul says that he put up with them in the wilderness. I don't remember reading that before. We had this discussion in class on Sunday. Um, we can read a passage of scripture and something jumps out at us now that we missed when we read it 30 times over the past 30 years or whatever. 
uh, but he tolerated them. God put up with the people in the wilderness. And that's what really happened. Uh, they whined the whole time, didn't they? And uh, one thing after another. Uh, and yet, thankfully, God put up with them. He endured the people. He tolerated them. He then brings them into the promised land. He destroys the nations who were there. He gives them the land. And once they're in the land, God gave them judges up through Samuel. And then when they asked for a king, God gave them Saul for 40 years. Um, I don't think that we're told in the Old Testament that Saul reigned for 40 years. I'm, I don't remember. I read that today that we don't know that except for here. So it's kind of interesting that Paul gives us kind of a new detail here that we don't have elsewhere. Uh, but they have Saul for 40 years, followed by David, a man after God's own heart. And so again, we have the entire history of the Jewish people from Egypt to David in only six verses. So he's kind of getting on the same page here. Uh, we then come to Jesus the Savior, a descendant of David. So his point there was to get to David. And so Paul then is explaining that Jesus is in the royal line. He is from the proper tribe, according to prophecy. Uh, Jesus is introduced by John, John the Baptist, John the Immerser, we might say, who prepared the way by preaching a baptism of repentance. And the emphasis here is that John is not the Savior. He's not, I'm not the guy. Uh, but he came announcing the coming of the Savior. He is completely unworthy. I am just the announcer. Uh, I am just getting this uh, introduced here. As Paul is speaking, we can be sure that those who knew the Law and the Prophets were comparing what Paul was saying to what they already know to be true. And so far, everything seems to fit. So it's like what we know about the Law and the Prophets, here's what this new guy is saying, and they're making those comparisons. And so up to this point, everything seems to fit. Paul is not contradicting the Prophets, but he's explaining how the events of the recent past actually fulfill everything that they've already heard. Well, he continues in verses 26 through 31. So let's continue then with Acts 13, 26 through 31. Brethren, sons of Abraham's family and those among you who fear God, to us the message of this salvation has been sent. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, recognizing neither him nor the utterances of the prophets which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled these by condemning him. And though they found no ground for putting him to death, they asked Pilate that he be executed. When they had carried out all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him up from the dead, and for many days he appeared to those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, the very ones who are now witnesses to the people. Starting in verse 26, Paul then continues addressing these people very respectfully as brethren, as sons of Abraham's family, as those who fear God. He's being very diplomatic here. And he explains that God's message of salvation has been sent to us. That'd be a reference to Paul and his traveling companions. Basically, we are here to explain this to you. We are now God's messengers. However, he also explains that their counterparts in Jerusalem failed to recognize Jesus as the Savior. Notice how diplomatic that is. He doesn't say the Jews, but he basically says those Jews over there, those people didn't get it. They missed the whole point here. Um, they read the prophets every Sabbath, just as you are doing. And yet, by failing to recognize Jesus in the prophets, they actually fulfilled the prophecies by condemning Jesus to death. And this is one thing that really impresses me here, how Paul refers in verse 29 to the Jews in Jerusalem. And he says, when they had carried out all that was written concerning him, they then took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. In other words, he's emphasizing that the Jews in Jerusalem, by killing Jesus, were actually fulfilling the promise, uh, prophecies, almost as if they were using the prophecies as some kind of guide. Obviously, they weren't, uh, but by opposing Jesus and putting him to death and doing everything that they did, they were actually fulfilling the law and the prophets. At the end of this paragraph, Paul gets to the resurrection and as we've discussed before, up to this point in Acts, the resurrection changes everything. Jesus died, yes. They nailed him to the cross. He was buried, but he didn't stay that way. He did not stay dead. He came back, and he appeared to a number of eyewitnesses. So let's continue then with Acts 13, 32 through 41. Acts 13, 32 through 41. And we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers that God has fulfilled this promise to our children, in that he raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second psalm, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Uh, 
as for the fact that he raised him up from the dead no longer to return to decay, he has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore he also says in another psalm, You will not allow your Holy One to undergo decay. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid among his fathers and underwent decay. But he whom God raised did not undergo decay. Therefore let it be known to you, brethren, that through him forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And through him everyone who believes is freed from all things from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. Therefore take heed so that the things spoken of us in the spoken of in the prophets may not come upon you. Behold you scoffers and marvel and perish, for I am accomplishing a work in your days, a work which you will never believe, though someone should describe it to you. In the first part of this next section, notice Paul emphasizes the resurrection. This is the good news, the gospel. The death, burial, and resurrection. The resurrection is God's answer to the promise that he made to the fathers. Uh, the resurrection is God's fulfillment of the promise he made to our children. So it's the fathers and the children. Uh, Paul then refers to what's been written, a reference to Psalm 2. This is the first of several references here, direct quotes. Uh, the next is from Isaiah 55.3. The next is from Psalm 16.10. And the point of all of this is that the resurrection is God's fulfillment of those prophecies. And in this way, Jesus is far superior than David. David was their uh, hero, but David's body is rotting in a tomb somewhere, and Jesus' body is not. That's a huge, uh, huge difference. And, um, and that brings us to the next paragraph here. In the last section, uh, Paul explains what the resurrection means to these people, or at least what it should mean. Because of the resurrection, Paul is able to proclaim the forgiveness of sins. Those who believe are freed from their sins, freed in a way that they can never be freed through the law of Moses. As I understand it then, Paul is accusing them of being enslaved. And this reminds us of a clash Jesus had with the Jews in John chapter 8. In John 8, 31, Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. You may remember in verse 33 of John 8, they answered him, We are Abraham's descendants, and we've never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it then that you say you will become free? And Jesus then answers them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. And it's amazing to me that the Jews were somehow able to say that they had never been enslaved to anyone. Can you imagine saying that? As a Jewish person back then, we've never been enslaved to anyone. They had completely forgotten about Egypt. They were enslaved in Egypt for many, many years. But as Jesus points out, they had also forgotten sin. It is possible to be enslaved by sin and not to know you're enslaved. I know today uh, we may talk to people in situations where they think that they're saved. They think everything's okay, uh, but they've been baptized for the wrong reason or maybe in the wrong way. They think everything's fine, but it's not. And that's kind of the situation here with these Jewish people. Um, in Acts 13, then, Paul continues this. He preaches freedom through Christ in a way that they never could have been freed from the law of Moses. The blood of bulls and goats does not wash away sins. Uh, in the last two verses here, Paul then warns them to take heed, to listen to obey, so that they do not perish. It's an amazing message. It's almost too good to be true. But Paul reminds them that this was predicted. So yet another prophecy. And that goes back to Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 5. And this is where he leads it. So we continue tonight then with Acts 13, 42 and 43, the next little paragraph here, Acts 13, 42 and 43. As Paul and Barnabas were going out, the people kept begging that these things might be spoken to them the next Sabbath. Now when the meeting of the synagogue had broken up, many of the Jews and of the God-fearing proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them were urging them to continue in the grace of God. Initially, then, the people wanted to hear more. In fact, they were begging to hear these things again the following Sabbath. Uh, many of the Jews and God-fearing Jewish converts actually follow Paul and Barnabas at this point, sticking with them during the week, apparently, so they can hear more. And Paul and Barnabas are continuing to teach, encouraging them to continue in the grace of God. In other words, keep on learning, keep on uh, heading in the right direction. So let's close tonight with Acts 13. Verses 44 through 52. Acts 13, verse 44 through the end of the chapter. The next Sabbath, nearly the whole city assembled to hear the word of the Lord. 
But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began contradicting the things spoken by Paul and were blaspheming. Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first. Since you repudiate it and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles, for so the Lord has commanded us. I have placed you as a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the end of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was being spread through the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of prominence and the leading men of the city and instigated a persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust of their feet in protest against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were continually filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. In verse 44, we find that the whole city assembled to hear the word of the Lord the following Sabbath day, so a week later. A few things to note here, starting with the fact that those who heard Paul speak on that first Sabbath apparently told their friends what they had heard, right? Because a week later, the whole city comes together. Something else to note here, uh, the fact that Paul's first sermon was clearly the word of the Lord. Paul didn't step up with his opinions about God. This wasn't Paul telling a bunch of stories about his life. This is not about Paul. But Paul was preaching the word of the Lord. He quoted over and over again from the prophets. Uh, he was not here by his own authority, uh, but he quoted from the prophets, from the word of God. The people then knew what to expect, and they came back for more of it. They wanted to hear more of the word of the Lord. However, when the Jewish leaders see the crowds, they are filled with jealousy, aren't they? They start uh, contradicting what Paul has said. So, no, that's not what happened. They're just going against. Whatever Paul says, they're against it. I kind of wonder what they're saying. We aren't told, um, other than that they're blaspheming. Literally, they are speaking out against God, uh, perhaps denying the resurrection, maybe repeating the coordinated lie that the disciples had stolen the body. Remember, that goes back to the, the very weekend Jesus died. Paul and Barnabas boldly answer uh, that they came to the synagogue because they were commanded by God to get the Jew, give the Jews an opportunity to hear the gospel first. Uh, but since they're rejecting it, since they are judging themselves unworthy of eternal life, we're not judging you unworthy. You are judging yourselves unworthy. Uh, Paul and Barnabas say they will now turn to the Gentiles. And to top it off, they have a quote for that as well. They quote from Isaiah 42, verse 6. It's kind of hard to, uh, to argue with Isaiah. Uh, the Gentiles are obviously thrilled to hear this. Uh, in the New American Standard, at least, they begin rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. Again, the emphasis is on the word of God, not Paul and Barnabas. Uh, years ago, one of our men was leading a prayer, and uh, he, he said, maybe by accident, at least I thought it was at the time, uh, he referred to God and, and said, we have come together to worship your word. And sitting in the pew, I thought, well, I've never heard that before. Maybe it was a slip of the tongue, but have we come here to worship the word of God? And uh, the more I thought about it, it, it's very accurate, isn't it? In a sense, we do come together to worship the word of God, don't we? In John 1.1, 1, 1, Jesus is described as being the word. Jesus is deity. And so, yes, we have, in fact, uh, come together to worship the word. And that's almost what we see here is these people begin rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. So they believe, and the word continues to spread throughout this entire region. This is in keeping with the outline provided by Jesus in Acts 1 verse 8, that the word would spread from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria, and then on to the remotest parts of the earth. Uh, unfortunately, the Jews take their jealousy. They allow it to transition into actual persecution. They incite the leading women and the leading men and use them to drive Paul and Barnabas out of that city. And I don't remember noticing this before, but the women are mentioned first. I don't often think about women leading a persecution. And yet that seems to be what happens here. The Jews rile up the women and the men. And they then work together to make Paul and Barnabas disappear. They run them out of town. Uh, in response, Paul and Barnabas willingly move along. There's a lot of ground to cover. They, they move along to the next city. And as they leave on their way out, notice how they shake the dust off of their feet as a protest against them. They're doing exactly what Jesus uh, told them to do back in Matthew 10, 14. They move along to Iconium, another city, 
uh, several miles to the east southeast uh, the disciples who were left behind though were continually filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. So that brings us to the end of Acts chapter 13, missionaries sent out. If you have an improvement on that, let me know. But I think that's a pretty good summary of what happens in this chapter. So next week then, let's pick up with Acts 14 as Paul and his companions continue on the first missionary journey. They keep going. Uh, thank you for taking time to study together with us tonight. It is important that we're still able to do this. I hope all of us can be present for worship this Sunday either at 9 or 11, and please also plan on joining us between those two services for a Bible study at 10. And please let me know if you have something that we need to be praying about. Uh, let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the God of Abraham, the great God who brought your people out of slavery in Egypt. For hundreds of years, you promised that a Savior was coming, and those prophecies were fulfilled perfectly and in every way in Jesus. Thank you for sending your only Son as a sacrifice for our sins. Thank you for his death and his resurrection. Thank you, Father, for saving us, and thank you for hearing our prayer. We come to you in the name of Jesus. Amen.